This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. One that everybody wants me. You're gonna acknowledge me. All right, everybody, welcome to the WWE podcast here on this Saturday, July 31st, 2021. Yep, I'm sneaking another one in. And I can guarantee you this is my last week in review for a little while. The reason I can guarantee that is because my wife is having a C-section scheduled for Wednesday morning. So that said, I certainly will not be doing a show on Wednesday or probably next Sunday. Um, Our co-host will be filling in for those shows. As far as the mailbag goes, guys, send me your messages. I'm going to see if uh, someone can do the mailbag. Um, I'm going to have a, a plan in place here that is the most streamlined way to give you an uninterrupted podcast without me, because I am certainly not the end all be all on this show. And I want to let you know up front, we're going to do the best we can to cover all shows and be as on time as we can, but just bear with us over the next few weeks here as we hopefully don't stumble through. I don't think we will. we got a great team. But um, things, you know, certainly are going to feel a little different without me here. Not for you guys, but for me, I'm selfishly wanting to be here. But obviously, priorities, priorities. So uh, just bear with us, guys, as we patch things together. And uh, my team will steer the ship just fine, I'm sure. So, all right. Well, that being said, and this is my final week in review for a while First of all, welcome, and thank you for choosing the WWE Podcast over really lots of options out there. We continue to be about in the top 45 to 50 consistently in uh, wrestling in the United States, so that's pretty damn cool, but uh, that's a thank you to you. That's because of you, not me, and I can sit here in my office and uh, talk about wrestling, but if nobody listens, then this show goes nowhere, so thank you, and let's get into wrestling because there is just so much to talk about, and yes, Bray Wyatt. I just released an entire show about 20, 20, 25 minutes on Bray Wyatt and AEW's Vince McMahon's comments on AEW. So it was like a little bit of a news brief segment. Uh, wasn't officially quick hits, but I guess, I don't know, maybe quick hits will phase into like a WWE news brief or something. We'll see. But I did an entire 20, 25 minutes on that. So if you want my detailed thoughts on that, head over to the, the show that I posted just before this one. So I'm not going to cover that in this show. Um, So let's move into SmackDown. SmackDown, um, again, Michael Ritter did an awesome job of covering SmackDown as always. And here's my two cents on it. God, SmackDown, such a better show. (laughs) I'm sure that's something you haven't heard from anybody over the last six months. But it's just, it's shorter. It's easier to follow. Storylines are more, more fun. And a lot of it, I just do think has to do with the fact that there's one hour less, there's 33% less time they have to fill, which means they only give you what you need to see. So, uh, raw needs to drop the three hours for God's sakes, please. I know that they use it for an additional hour of revenue for ads. I get it. So they won't, but, uh, boy, the product suffers when they do that. So nonetheless, I want to dive into, uh, I want to dive into Roman Reigns, John Cena, because right now, that is that is the star of the show, right? Roman Reigns, John Cena, they are the stars of the show, and rightfully so. And I do have to say, John Cena did a nice job of cutting into Roman Reigns this week, saying how if somebody can... And he responded to the whole missionary thing. By the way, I think they should get away from the missionary thing, okay? And I think they did after uh, Cena responded to it, saying that if somebody can keep you interested with missionary for 20 years, you should keep him around, Right? Clever. He always has something good to say. Always clever and always gets the shot in. And he uh, he talked about how Roman Reigns was ducking him and that he's just a scared little boy. And Roman Reigns didn't come out. And we said at the we heard at the end of the night, it's going to be a contract sign or not the end of the night, but later in the show, there's going to be a contract signing between Finn Balor and Roman Reigns. And we got that contract signing. And. It was a contract signing that 
I, I can't say I haven't seen before, but it, it the logic with this was flawed. However, the flawed logic was acknowledged. And what I mean by that is we had Finn Balor about to sign the contract for SummerSlam. And we had, who was it? Um, Corbin. We had Baron Corbin interrupt in his stained shirt, uh, receding hairline, growing, just disheveled mess, trying to, to uh, take out Finn so he could sign the contract in place of Finn. And then John Cena arrives to take out Corbin again, and he did it earlier in the, earlier in the night, and then he signed the contract himself. And I'm thinking to myself, anybody that knows anything about basic common just legality, you can't sign a contract that's meant for someone else. You, you can't do it, right? How do I know you can't do it? Well, think about this very, very basic example. Say Vince McMahon is offering a contract. They're in the boardroom, and he's offering a contract he, uh, uh, to John Cena for, I don't know, two million dollars over two over a two and a half year deal. And I bust in the boardroom, or you do. You kick the door down, and it's just as John Cena is about to sign it, you sign it. And all of a sudden, you get John Cena's spot and his money. I'm fairly sure that's not how it works, right? So, like, when you take this example and you try, you apply it to, you know, any other logic that exists anywhere in contracts, you know, that, that document would be null and void. Just because someone else signs it doesn't mean that it automatically transfers all of the benefits or liabilities to that person that signed it when it wasn't for the intended person. So, again, it's, I don't think I'm nitpicking. I don't think that I'm making this too far of a stretch to say that, you know, that, that's not how things work, right? It's, it also sets a terrible precedent for any contract signing moving forward ever, because if this logic holds, then all someone has to do is steal the contract from whoever they want to take the spot of and sign their name. It's a terrible precedent to set terrible now i'll give them this they at least acknowledge the fact that hey is this legal can this happen how does this happen paul Heyman brought it up the announcers brought it up and i'm like okay good at least they're they're acknowledging the obvious and we know that roman reigns wasn't going to voluntarily face john cena until his hand was forced i understand that he's the heel and he's trying to avoid the baby face. I get it. And I'm not complaining about that. But again, this this kind of thing, even though it was acknowledged, and I appreciate the fact that it was acknowledged, and nobody appreciates acknowledgement, certainly more than Roman Reigns. But when you do something that is just so impossible from a legal standpoint, it, it, it's like, wait, what? <laughs> it. I don't know. Uh, they acknowledged it, but then they didn't do anything with it. And, like, and then we have Adam Pierce going, eh, well, it looks official to me. I'm thinking, did Adam Pierce attend law school that we don't know of? Is he an Esquire? Is, you know, like, what gives Adam Pierce the, the skill set to decide by a quick glance that, yep, looks good. I see Cena's name. So, uh, you know, he signed it. So, yep, looks good. No, that's not how things work, Adam, but it won't be explored. It won't be dug into any more than they did this week. I appreciate that they did, but the logic is fatally flawed, not even just slightly or severely. I'm talking fatally. It shoots it dead. Again, anybody wants an example, <laughs> just just uh, try to sign a contract that someone else that it's intended for someone else or another party and sign it on their behalf and then tell them, Oh, well, I signed it before you. So it looks like I win. He, you know, he, he, you know, I, I get all the money. Yeah. I'm fairly sure that's not going to hold up in court. Uh, I, I just go out on a limb and say that, but whatever it's pro wrestling logic. Fine. We're living in an alternate universe. Yeah, it's not the worst thing I've seen. It just does set a terrible precedent moving forward because now when you see somebody in a contract signing, men, women, whoever, 
uh, you're going to say, well, um, why doesn't so and so just come down, steal the contract, and sign it in there on you know on their behalf, and uh, they'll get into the match? It's a dangerous precedent that will never be explored again, and everyone will forget it. But I won't, and I'm sure you won't either, because you're smarter than the average fan listening to this show. Um, not that we're smarter than anybody else, but I think that those fans that listen to wrestling podcasts probably have a willingness to learn more about the business than uh, than the average fan. But anyway, that's uh, that's my only complaint is that massive logistic hole, even though they tried to fill it and acknowledge it just didn't, didn't work. But now it's official. Now we have Roman Reigns and John Cena at SummerSlam as if there was any doubt. We do get it. We're not going to get a triple threat. I don't want a triple threat. It looks like Baron Corbin and Finn Balor are probably going to be in a uh, in a match at SummerSlam, I would assume. And perhaps Finn ends up facing Roman Reigns in the September and October pay-per-view events to get him to Survivor Series, which, you know, who knows what's going to happen at that point. And then The Rock shows up. And, of course, that program is scheduled to start, again, assumingly, we, it, it, these kinds of things can all, all just go up and smoke in, a, in an instant, right? I mean, so, but it's right now, apparently the plan is to have The Rock come in in November and run a program from November to April leading into uh, WrestleMania between the two having a match. So that said, I expect Finn Balor to return to the title picture as Roman's next opponent shortly after SummerSlam, after John Cena goes away and back to Hollywood and filming whatever movie he's he's filming, which is fine, right? We, As wrestling fans, I think we've kind of gotten used to people leaving us, big stars leaving us to just go to Hollywood. It's just one of those things. I don't think we feel betrayed anymore. The Rock was the first one to really do it, and it turned The Rock heel unintentionally, and then John Cena was burying The Rock for doing it, and then John Cena did it. So uh, at this point, it's we all just go, huh. Eh. Well, it's going to happen, right? Like we we know, we know. And and it's it's just par for the course and you can't fault somebody for trying to make more money by not tearing your body up on a nightly basis and making a lot more money to do it. So I uh, you, you can't blame somebody for that. You really can't. So all right. Well, again, I'm looking forward to this match. This John Cena Roman Reigns match. <clears throat> the one thing that I'm really looking forward to is the promo, I've said this since it happened two weeks ago when John Cena returned at Money in the Bank, that I'm looking forward to their face-to-face promo. And I don't know if we're going to get it. I really don't. I'm, logic would dictate that we would. And now that it's official, you would think over the next couple of weeks that we should get that because it would just make sense. And right now they've just been doing kind of... Uh, parallel promos to each other rather than face to face with John Cena cutting his promo opening the show and then Roman Reigns responds later in the show they have yet to go face to face on it and one thing I'll say if you notice Roman Reigns' face when John Cena gets in the ring it seems like genuine disdain and it also looks like a lot from looks a lot like his baby face reaction to John Cena in the ring the first time around in 2017 that those facial reactions have not changed. And I think there's some genuine animosity there and genuine, um, genuine frustration on Roman's part to try to fire back at Cena for humiliating him in that promo. Now, was that promo a work shoot? I think partially. Yeah. In that 2017 uh, leading up to no mercy for their, their match there. And, but I think that deep down Roman Reigns wants to fire back hard on John Cena, but I will say, I don't think Roman Reigns is ready for the wrath of John Cena. John Cena turns it up to 10. I I don't think there's any chance of Roman Reigns coming out on top there. I really don't, which is problematic because right now Roman Reigns is your top guy. You don't want John Cena carving up your 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 heel and and taking away some of that mystique, some of that progress they've made over the last year by John Cena coming in for a short term program with John with uh with Roman Reigns just to tear him down to leave. That's not the purpose, and John Cena would agree. So they have to be careful. This isn't so much of a playing with house money as it was with him as a babyface and John Cena as a babyface. 
this is different. This is a different animal because they've created something very special with the heel Roman reigns. So as much as we want to see what it's like, I would, I would be extra careful. And I'm sure they are too, that, that it's not too much of a takedown of Roman. And you would like to believe, you know, it, we would all like to be at the place as fans to say, yeah, man, a Roman Reigns is so good on the mic. I can't wait to see what happens. And you feel confident that Roman could hold his own, but I am not confident. You know, we would love to say that, but I'm not confident Roman could hold his own. John Cena is so good on the mic when he's not being silly. Like, like funny John Cena is the worst version of John Cena ever. I don't like when John Cena is condescending. It's self-deprecating humor. I don't that or when he's trying to be silly. Um, th- those those are the worst parts of John Cena. But as bad as those parts are, when he turns it on into serious Cena, it is the best you'll see on a microphone. I'm sorry it is. So the summer of Cena as they're marketing it, right? It's the summer of Cena. It looks like John Cena is going to be at every show. Uh, leading into the pay-per-view. So that's kind of cool. And uh, we'll see if he shows up on Raw too. I have a feeling he probably won't because Roman Reigns isn't there. So what's he doing there? Uh, I I wouldn't think so. But if they do the face-to-face, I think it's going to be a much more controlled interaction rather than much, rather than the freedom they were given the last time to see, you know, who's got what and where do they stand? Because if they do that, it's going to be very clear that Roman Reigns has maybe not made the progress that we all had hoped, especially on the microphone, because he hasn't been challenged in this way before, specifically with a guy that is one of the best of all time on the microphone. So, all right. Well, let's continue on uh, a little bit about Baron Corbin, though. I have to say Baron Corbin is, I think we finally are seeing a direction for Corbin. But, you know, at first it was a little bit of sympathy, feel bad for the guy, you know, he's, he fell on, he fell on hard times. Now his wife has left him. Uh, He lost all of his money. He lost his crown. He's no longer the king. Uh, Just a complete fall into obscurity and, and just hard times. And it's funny to watch now. Now it's turned from sympathy to kind of a pitiful fool. And the, the, the best part is this week, I think from Corbin was when John Cena gave him like a couple hundred bucks that it looked like he had in his pocket. Uh, those were hundred dollar bills. And after John Cena gave it to him, uh, Corbin looked at him and said, that's it. And called him selfish. You know, you're a movie star. You know, why can't you put me in one of your movies? It was, it was hilarious when, when Corbin said, that's it. And he's not grateful for what he's got. And he he actually gets angry that Cena didn't give him more. That was, that to me was, it was funny, but it also told me the direction they're going with the character that this is going to be a pitiful, just annoyance that he's, he's going to be like the guy that if you're on your way to work and a homeless guy always stops you. Right. The homeless guy's constantly stopping you or the, or the homeless guy that's at the same corner that we all know. Right. Like the, maybe hanging around a mall where, where I am, it's, it's at, at a mall and it's in the same spot. It's like they, they, they just make a living there, I guess. And at first you feel guilty and maybe there's a part of you that's kind of like feels you know bad for the guy or girl. And then you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute. I've seen documentaries like this where people actually make more doing this than they did. They did if they worked a full-time job and they're just wearing you know, baggy ripped up clothes and it's all an act and it's a scam, all this stuff. Like I've seen documentaries on that, which makes you wonder about all the homeless people you see. Now, of course, I don't think everybody's like that, but it makes you kind of wonder they're always hanging out here. There's a zillion jobs open right now. If you can't find work right now, I mean, you're just not trying. I'm sorry. You're not. There is work everywhere because people are sitting home collecting their unemployment checks as the federal government decides to just continue to dish them out, which anyway, I'm going to get on on off topic here. But my point is you kind of feel the same way about the homeless person that you do about Baron Corbin, except now Baron Corbin has kind of shown his hand 
in that he he is looking for handouts. And when someone gives him something, instead of being grateful for it, he gets angry that it's not enough. So that's funny. And I think there's something they could do with that. I hope Corbin continues to come out with the same stained shirt every week. It's starting to to turn me into a bit of a fan of Corbin and not in a way that would make me cheer for him, but in a way that would be fun to watch him get beat up. Now it's, it's turned from pity and sympathy to annoyance. And that's a good thing. I mean, I mean that in a, in a good way, not in a channel changing heat way or anything like that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I hope he continues to wear the same stained shirt and grow his hair out. I mean, it's going to get, it's going to get funnier and funnier every week. So he's kind of like a heel comedy break. So I'm good with it. I'm good with it. I like this change in Corbin because he can talk on the mic. I, I like this. I'm a fan. And uh, having seen it give him the attitude adjustment was fun. And uh, that, that's exactly what you wanted. It, it was a nice, clean cut, I guess, no pun intended there, segment. So, all right, let's let's uh, let's move on. And let's talk about Sasha Banks. Sasha Banks returns. Helps out uh, Bianca Belair from getting beat down by Carmella and uh, Zelina Vega. And a big pop, pretty big pop from the, the crowd there. And, you know, initially when she started beating down and helping out Bianca, I said, something ain't right. And again, the announcers didn't insult our intelligence, nor did Bianca to some extent. By acknowledging, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, the last time we saw these two, they were battling it out at WrestleMania. And I was thinking, yeah, this, this is uh, this is icky. It felt a lot like Asuka and Charlotte, right? When Charlotte returned and Asuka and Charlotte were just BFFs. It made no sense at all that they're suddenly just like the most, the, you know, loving friends and that they, you know, they're sending each other Christmas cards. It it didn't make sense. This one felt a little weird too, and it felt a little bit like something ain't right. But 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 the announcers did acknowledge that, and I like that. The only problem I had with this was Bianca, who just reciprocated the hug. She did seem with her facials a little confused as to why are you hugging me? What's going on? And she was, you know, it didn't take her more than but five seconds to just fully buy in, though, to Sasha Banks, which uh, I, I don't know, it makes kind of makes her look like a fool a little bit. That said, at least it did only last that night. It's not like she was fooled for many weeks. And then the, the shoe dropped. So Sasha Banks coming out and uh, hugging her and all that kind of thing. Bianca needs to stop being so damn nice. I'll say that. Like, I love her as champion. I, I think Bianca has done a superb job as champion, especially considering what could have happened and what really did happen to Rhea Ripley, which is kind of a disaster. But Bianca has done a really nice job as champion. And I got to say that while she did look like a fool for trusting her, it's a smart move to keep Sasha Banks heel. You already have a top baby face. You need another top heel. And Bailey's out. And who else are you going to? We can't go back to Carmella. She's been beat every single week for like the last month. Y you can't do that. And so Sasha turning heel was the right move. They go from WrestleMania to SummerSlam, main eventing each. And I, I'm really looking forward to their rematch at SummerSlam. Uh, Sasha Banks, rather, beating down Bianca after Bianca got the victory in, her, in their, their main event tag team match. Bianca gets the victory and then Sasha and her are dancing to their music and she hit a backstabber and just beat her down and made her tap. And it, it was a nice beat down and the crowd went along with it. And it, it was just very well done by all involved. And yes, Bianca did look like a fool for trusting Sasha given Sasha's history. Uh, you would think that she'd be a little bit smartened up, but I swear to you, if, if Sasha or Bianca comes out next week, and they have a SummerSlam sign hanging from the rafters. And she doesn't attack Sasha Banks, but rather says, oh, girl, oh, don't make me do it. Don't make me do it. And instead of attacking Sasha, she points at a SummerSlam sign as if that's some kind of retribution in and of itself. I may lose my mind. 
<laughs> like if there's ever a time for Bianca to lose her cool, now is the time. So I, I just, I could see that happening though, because I think Bianca is just too nice sometimes of a character and she needs a bit more of an edge and to, to take the aggressive approach once in a while. So I sw- just, you know, next week, Sasha or Bianca, please, uh, no pointing. Okay. Punching and kicking are appropriate here. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. Let me know what you guys think. Are you looking forward to Bianca Sasha part two? I am. And, and I think most fans I would assume are, uh, as well. So, all right. So uh, let's continue on here to Seth Rollins attacking edge. You know, it's about time. We get a little bit of heat from Seth Rollins. Edge has seemingly got the better of him. As of late, and it's time to get a little bit of heel on the heat, heat on the heel rather. And it, it was nice. So he, you know, Rollins used a television camera hitting Edge pretty hard in the head, and cutting a promo saying that if he can't be Universal Champion, neither can Edge. It was really nice from Seth Rollins. A very concise, easy to follow story here, and uh, you know, we will never know what Edge was coming out to say or do because Rollins attacked him from behind fairly quickly and didn't give the audience a chance to know and what, what the heck he was doing. But I like this program. I think it's on pace to be a very nice matchup at SummerSlam as we all thought it would be. And I still think it would be, it has a chance, a chance to be the match of the night. Although there are certainly some contenders out there, John Cena, Roman Reigns, Bianca Belair versus Sasha Banks. Uh, Bobby Lashley and Goldberg is not even going to be a consideration, but I'm just going down the known card right now. And uh, Seth Rollins edge is going to be fun. It's going to be fun if they give them like 15, 16, 17 minutes. I think that they could, they could put on a really nice show and I'm looking forward to seeing what, what edge does and says in return next week. You know, I've been waiting for a full blown dive head first dive into the Rated R superstar edge, not Adam Copeland making a comeback in a feel good story, but rather edge, like truly edge, not Adam, because I feel like for a while we felt that this is just kind of Adam Copeland's comeback and it's feel good. And that that's certainly great. And, and we, we, I think generally support that as fans, but I want edge. Does that make sense to anybody out there? And I think he's shown more of that especially since WrestleMania of being more of that guy rather than kind of speaking about his return rather than just, just diving into the character and just be, be your character. You know, what, what are you doing here? Right. Like why, what is your mission? Right. I don't know. Uh, That's the way I felt. I love edge and I've loved his return. I'm not, I'm not crapping on anything he's done. I would just prefer that I don't look at him as Adam Copeland and look at him as truly edge that we all knew and love from, you know, 12 years ago. So, but anyway, there's just some small suggestion. Okay. The 24 seven championship Reginald versus Chad Gable. Now Reggie, uh, this was a, ended in a DQ after interference from Otis and Gable was a surprise opponent for Reggie who was about to win when Otis jumped into the ring into attack. So I don't understand <laughs> this, why this is an actual official match and, and rather if it's a disqualification, how how is it disqual how is it a disqualification if the championship itself determines that there are no rules and you can win anywhere anytime? How I mean, maybe the parameters of a ring and this being an actual official match is what supersedes what the twenty four seven title means and how it's defended. Fine, I'll go with that. But if that's the case, and the match is over, it's DQ. Fine. Why couldn't we have Reginald or rather Chad Gable and Otis go back after Reginald to capture the belt. I mean, technically you're, you know, there's a match at any time for that championship. So anyway, I, I guess it's neither here nor there. I was actually kind of hoping the 24 seven title had uh, just died a quick death. I was wrong, but I did like Otis. Uh, Otis is, doesn't say much, but when he does, you listen and I, and I, I love his facial expressions Again, he's gotten rid of that kind of redneck voice that he did, which I think has really helped him. I think having 
Otis get rid of that voice and, and the, of course the beard and, and the, the, the shirts, everything else, and just make him a, a monster heel is it's going to be fun. I love the slow build of Otis. I think this is the best way to build him. And certainly this is a, uh, this is going to be fun. So Big E, Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura defeat Apollo Crews, Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler via pinfall after Nakamura hit Cruz with a Kinshasa. Um, I have no problem with Nakamura winning. I guess I have a problem with Apollo Crews being defined down seemingly over the last several weeks. He hasn't got a whole lot of mic time. And when he does get in the ring, he gets pinned or beaten pretty quickly. I, I'm not a fan of that because I love what Apollo Crews has, what they've done with his career and credit to Apollo and creative for really just overnight flipping the career, his career on its head in a good way. So I don't like that Apollo Crews is getting the short end of the stick, so to speak here. Uh, Nakamura getting the victory is fine, but we still have Cesaro who's back in no man's land. You notice Cesaro's right back where he started before Roman Reigns. You guys notice that back to not being able to speak good and ring worker. And that's it. <laughs> like, that's where Cesaro has landed. I think we know his role now. Big E, you guys know how I feel about him. Great athlete. Good look. But we still have the power of positivity in his entrance. I don't know how to make this any clearer or how WWE officials and management and Vince doesn't see it himself. You can't be an offshoot. You need to carve your own damn path especially when you're running a gimmick that's been run into the ground for the last seven years. seems like maybe not that long, but it, it just is too much. It's too much. And it's stunting the growth of biggie. It is. So as far as Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode go, I mean, you, you guys know what you're going to get with from, from them. Good to very good matches. They don't say a whole lot other than Dolph Ziggler calling themselves the dirty dogs. And they end up being on the losing on the losing side of most matches. That that's that's pretty much it. Uh, Jimmy Uso uh, gets beat by Rey Mysterio with a crucifix because of Dominic coming in to push Mysterio, push his dad, and hold him, hold him with his feet to secure the victory, as the Usos had done in the previous two matches against them. So it's kind of tit for tat there. Rey Mysterio beats Jimmy Uso to their surprise. As Jimmy and Jay, if you've noticed, are slowly starting to move away from Roman Reigns. You notice that? They're on their own storyline. I understand that. That's good. They have their own storyline. They're the tag team champions. But they haven't done a whole lot with Roman over the last geez, few weeks. And I'm, I, I can see an argument on both sides for that being a good and bad thing. I would argue that at least we should see them together once a show. If it's backstage talking or whatever, just so we have that unity because this is the bloodline. This is a big deal. It took a long time to get all three of these guys together. This is the true bloodline. They've actually labeled it as a bloodline, not just me calling it that by default, but rather it is actually marketed as such. So I'm thinking, hey, Let's uh, let's solidify this because we're trying to sell merch, even though they're heels. You still sell merch. A lot of heels sell merch. I bet your Roman Reigns head of the table shirts are up there. It's a good looking shirt, especially the white one. It's a good shirt. It really is. I actually thought about buying one. I'm not being facetious. <laughs> I'm being for real. So um, anyway. All right. What else happened? I think that might be it. I mean, it's a, it's a two hour shows go quick, don't they? Uh, again, for Monday Night Raw, you guys heard my entire Raw review. This week, though, we got a preview for Raw saying that it's going to be Nikki A.S.H. Because we don't say Cross. We don't say Ash. We actually have to say the letters, which is awful. But we do uh, get a rematch between the two in a no disqualification women's championship contenders match. Like, wh wh what is that exactly? We still have not been told what a contenders match is. Is it a number one contenders? Is it you just get to qualify to be in a in a pre-selected group of people that can challenge for the championship? 
Like, what exactly is a contenders match? Why aren't they explaining it? Uh, it's mind boggling. But whatever that is, that's what's going on. Whatever the hell kind of match that is, that's what Nikki Cross, rather Nikki ASH, and Charlotte are having on Monday night. So, uh, but we did get Nikki getting her ass beat by Charlotte on Raw, which was so awesome and fun to watch. Just so cool. So good. So good. So good. But uh, what else happened? Damian Priest defeated Sheamus via pinfall. We got AJ and almost defeating the Viking Raiders. We got Drew McIntyre defeating Veer via disqualification, which was the most bizarre qualifi- disqualification of all time. Having Veer get disqualified and having McIntyre win even after Veer brought in the chair. It was the most, it was a very weird, weird ending. But this does continue things, obviously, for Jinder and Drew all the way to SummerSlam. And Jinder versus Drew is, you know, I think it's a match that a lot of people, I know that a lot of people are not high on Jinder. And I've said this with my co-hosts that, and, and a lot of them aren't high on Jinder either. And I understand why. But he's a great foreign heel. And I don't mean that a great as in he's a great performer all all around. I think he just plays the role of being that obnoxious foreign invader very well. And yes, Drew is foreign himself, but he doesn't wear it on his shoulder, so to speak, in a in a way that makes it obnoxious, whereas Jinder does, and he's got the facials of a heel. His the way he smiles and sneers probably does it too much. But it's tailored to a heel and for that role. So I think that Jinder is good in his role. I really do. Do I think he should be main event level? No. No, I don't. Not at this point. So those people are thinking, what are you talking about? Jinder? No, no, no. I'm not advocating for him to be champion. I'm just saying in a, in a time when there's a lack of heels and top heels and top baby faces, let's give somebody another opportunity here. It's been a while since the whole Randy Orton debacle and he was champion and he was champion for six months. It's been a while since that. So I'm willing to let this play out and see if Jinder can rise to the occasion and, uh, and further his career because I'm all for top heels. I love top heels because they make the baby faces that much better. So I'm looking forward to the match at SummerSlam and I want to see Jinder get his ass kicked. That's how, you know, mission accomplished. And I want to see the aggressiveness and the evolution of, of Jinder. I'm sorry, of, uh, of Drew continue. Cause it seems like he's on some kind of, some kind of evolution here of more aggressive, more edgy. So, alrighty, let's see what else happened that uh, I can expand upon. Of course, we got Karrion Cross defeating Keith Lee <laughs> with the cross jacket, Mansoor and uh, Mustafa Ali defeating Mason T Bar, or as Amanda would say, Bebop and Rocksteady. Uh, John Morrison defeats Riddle via pinfall after hitting sh- Starship Pain. And, you know, Riddle, I, I do miss Randy Orton now. I, I got to say, I miss Randy Orton. It's time to bring him back into the fold. If he's, if he's not injured now, if he's injured, obviously the hands are, our hands are tied and that's a different story. But if it's just to keep him off, to keep him off, uh, why? <laughs> I think Riddle and Randy Orton were cooking up some, some good food there, so to speak. And I think that them, uh, with their merchandise and everything that was, I, I think, on track to probably start selling a lot got cut short. I hope it's due to an injury because at this point it, it, the storyline's begging Randy Orton to come back. It's been what, like six weeks, maybe more. So hopefully they can bring him back sooner than later. Uh, let's see here. I think that pretty much rounds out. I mean, we had Damian priest defeat Seamus after hitting reckoning Damian priest. It was a clean victory beating Seamus. That was a bit surprising, um, but if they're trying to get contenders for championships, I would argue that it's probably the, the days of Sheamus being United States champion are very, very numbered right now. Very numbered. So, all righty. Let's see. I think that pretty much sums it up. And we have, of course, I'll, I'll end it with Goldberg and Lashley. I mean, this uh, coming week, we're going to have Goldberg come back and respond to the non-response of Bobby Lashley. I would assume that it's going to be just like the SmackDown where the heels avoiding the, the returning babyface legend. And then eventually their hand, hand is forced in some form or fashion their, their arms going to be twisted, so to speak. And that individual will be forced to face Bobby Lashley. In this case, will be forced to face Goldberg. 
uh, one way or the other. And uh, nobody's looking forward to this. Those of you who are in attendance, please don't cheer to cheer because you're back and everything's great. I'm encouraging booze for Goldberg. And I'm, you know, if you're going to Vegas for SummerSlam, please boo. I want to see what WWE does with a house full of 60,000 people booing out Goldberg. I want to see what they do. How are we not booing Goldberg at this point? Can anyone give me a logical reason why Goldberg at this stage in his career should be cheered? Can can anyone do that? Because I've got about a hundred reasons that Goldberg should not be cheered. And a couple of them are, he's, he was never a WWE legend, by the way. He was a WCW legend. His moveset is extremely limited. He's going to limit the opponent he has in the ring, no matter how good they are, because he's limited himself. You know it's going to be finisher heavy match right from the get go. He's going to go for a spear. Um, you 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 know that it's going to be again a short match under five minutes, and that's terrible for a talent like Bobby Lashley who's being handcuffed by the limitations of Goldberg. And you have a guy coming back at 54 that, what, feels entitled? Again, the character, not the man. He's just doing what he's told. But you have Goldberg coming back at this stage and just assuming he should get a championship match? Why? How many times has he done this? What exactly has he done to earn a championship match? The answer is nothing. So until somebody gives me a reason to cheer for Goldberg other than cool entrance music, cool entrance and he can make crazy facial expressions and he's super intense. I have yet to hear a coherent argument for cheering for Goldberg. And I, I just don't understand the logic behind people in attendance cheering for him. Is it because he's a legend and you haven't been in a wrestling event in like two years because of COVID or whatnot? And you're just excited to be there because you know it's a special occasion. And Goldberg is, you know, not going to be doing too many more matches. Like, what is the appeal? What is the appeal? Is, is it a Pavlovian response where we just hear, hear Goldberg's music and we just cheer because that's what we used to do? People aren't thinking logically with this. And every time I hear a crowd, they disappoint me. They disappoint the hell out of me. I can see Goldberg opening the show for Monday Night Raw just so that it's a fresh crowd. You're the first one out. You're more likely to be cheered if you're the first one out, even if you're a heel. So if they were smart and they're trying to mitigate any potential heel response and booze, they'll put Goldberg out there first. We'll see if that happens. That's my guess as he opens raw. But that said, if, if people were using their, their noodles, they'd be saying, wait a minute. Uh, why are we cheering this guy again over Bobby Lashley, a guy that's been here day in, day out for several years, took a break from WWE, but was here and has been here for a lot of time. And a guy that never got an opportunity at the championship, uh, or at least won it. And it's been a long grind for Bobby Lashley. And we're going to cheer for a guy that was, what, part of WCW? A guy that was just super intense. And he was a a big star. There's no question. I'm not downplaying his impact. It's just a different time. This This isn't 1998 anymore. So, whatever. All right. Well, that concludes my weekend review, everybody. And probably concludes it for some time as... Things are about to get crazy for me, but hopefully for you, it's it's really an uninterrupted experience the next few weeks with our co-hosts taking control and uh, just filling in for me as I as I deal with my new addition. Uh, all good stuff, all good stuff. But we're gonna have uh, Anthony cover. Anthony DeMarco will be covering the weekend review, so that'll be a, a fun time, I'm sure. So. Until then, guys, I really I don't know the next time. I, I, I don't think I'll be able to do the raw review this week. I don't think I will, uh, given it'll be the night before we go to the hospital. It may be chaotic. If I do it Monday night, that's the only chance I have. So perhaps I do it Monday night. That said, I'd have to stay up until after raw. And then, I, yeah, probably not. <laughs> so uh, this may be the last time that we interact until I return. So with everything, guys, thank you so much. And I'll be talking to you real soon and talking to you next time.